verses 19 to 23. That one great thing which they should prophesy of should be the judgment that was coming upon the Jewish nation, for this was the chief thing that Christ himself had foretold, Mt 24, at his entrance into Jerusalem, Lu 1941, and when he was going to die, Lu 2329, and these judgments were to be brought upon them to punish for their contempt of the gospel, and their opposition to it, though it came to them thus proved. Those that would not submit to the power of God's grace, in this wonderful effusion of his spirit, should fall and lie under the pourings out of the vials of his wrath. Those shall break that will not bend. First, the destruction of Jerusalem, which was about forty years after Christ's death, is here called that great and notable day of the Lord, because it put a final period to the Mosaic economy, the Levitical priesthood and the ceremonial law were thereby forever abolished and done away. The desolation itself was such as was never brought upon any place or nation, either before or since. It was the day of the Lord, for it was the day of his vengeance upon that people for crucifying Christ, and persecuting his ministers, it was the year of recompenses for that controversy, yet, and for all the blood of the saints and martyrs, from the blood of righteous Abel, Mt 2335. It was a little day of judgment, it was a notable day, in Joel it is called a terrible day, for so it was to men on earth, but here Epiphane, after the Septuagint, a glorious, illustrious day, for so it was to Christ in heaven, it was the Epiphany, his appearing, so he himself spoke of it, Mt 24,30. The destruction of the Jews was the deliverance of the Christians, who were hated and persecuted by them, and therefore that day was often spoken of by the prophets of that time, for the encouragement of suffering Christians, that the Lord was at hand, the coming of the Lord drew nigh, the judge stood before the door, James 5 colon 8, 9. Secondly, the terrible presages of that destruction are here foretold, there shall be wonders in heaven above, the sun turned into darkness and the moon into blood, and signs too in the earth beneath, blood and fire. Josephus, in his preface to his history of the wars of the Jews, speaks of the signs and prodigies that preceded them, terrible thunders, lightnings, and earthquakes, there was a fiery comet that hung over the city for a year, and a flaming sword was seen pointing down upon it, a light shone upon the temple and the altar at midnight, as if it had been noonday. Dr. Lightfoot gives another sense of these presages, the blood of the Son of God, the fire of the Holy Ghost now appearing, the vapor of the smoke in which Christ ascended, the sun darkened, and the moon made blood, at the time of Christ's passion, were all loud warnings given to that unbelieving people to prepare for the judgments coming upon them. Or, it may be applied, and very fitly, to the previous judgments themselves by which that desolation was brought on. The blood points at the wars of the Jews with the neighboring nations, with the Samaritans, Syrians, and Greeks, in which abundance of blood was shed, as there was also in their civil wars, and the struggles of the seditious, as they called them, which were very bloody, there was no peace to him that went out nor to him that came in. The fire and vapor of smoke, here foretold, literally came to pass in the burning of their cities and towns and synagogues, and temple at last. And this turning of the sun into darkness, and the moon into blood, bespeaks the dissolution of their government, civil and sacred, and the extinguishing of all their lights. Thirdly, the signal preservation of the Lord's people is here promised, v 21 Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus, which is the description of a true Christian, 1 co 1 colon 2, shall be saved, shall escape that judgment which shall be a type and earnest of everlasting salvation. In the destruction of Jerusalem by the Chaldeans, there was a remnant sealed to be hid in the day of the Lord's anger, and in the destruction by the Romans not one Christian perished. Those that distinguish themselves by singular piety shall be distinguished by special preservation. And observe, the saved remnant are described by this, that they are a praying people, they call on the name of the Lord, which intimates that they are not saved by any merit or righteousness of their own, but purely by the favor of God, which must be sued out by prayer. It is the name of the Lord which they call upon that is their strong tower. The application of this prophecy to the present event, v 16 this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, it is the accomplishment of that, it is the full accomplishment of it. 
This is that effusion of the Spirit upon all flesh which should come, and we are to look for no other, no more than we are to look for another Messiah, for as our Messiah ever lives in heaven, reigning and interceding for his church on earth, so this Spirit of grace, the Advocate, or Comforter, that was given now, according to the promise, will, according to the same promise, continue with the church on earth to the end, and will work all its works in it and for it, and every member of it, ordinary and extraordinary, by means of the scriptures and the ministry. That it was the gift of Christ, and the product and proof of his resurrection and ascension. From this gift of the Holy Ghost, he takes occasion to preach unto them Jesus, and this part of his sermon he introduces with another solemn preface, V22 You men of Israel, hear these words. It is a mercy that you are within hearing of them, and it is your duty to give heed to them. Words concerning Christ should be acceptable words to the men of Israel. Here is an abstract of the history of the life of Christ, v. 22. He calls him Jesus of Nazareth, because by that name he was generally known, but, which was sufficient to roll away that reproach, he was a man approved of God among you, censured and condemned by men, but approved of God. God testified his approbation of his doctrine by the power he gave him to work miracles, a man marked out by God, so Dr. Hammond reads it, signalized and made remarkable among you that now hear me. He was sent to you, set up, a glorious light in your land, you yourselves are witnesses how he became famous by miracles, wonders, and signs, works above the power of nature, out of its ordinary course, and contrary to it, which God did by him, that is, which he did by that divine power with which he was clothed, and in which God plainly went along with him, for no man could do such works unless God were with him. See what a stress Peter lays upon Christ's miracles. The matter of fact was not to be denied, they were done in the midst of you, in the midst of your country, your city, your solemn assemblies, as you yourselves also know. You have been eyewitnesses of his miracles, I appeal to yourselves whether you have anything to object against them or can offer anything to disprove them. The inference from them cannot be disputed, the reasoning is as strong as the evidence, if he did those miracles, certainly God approved him, declared him to be, what he declared himself to be, the Son of God and the Savior of the world, for the God of truth would never set his seal to a lie. An account of his death and sufferings which they were witness of also but a few weeks ago, and this was the greatest miracle of all, that a man approved of God should thus seem to be abandoned of him, and a man thus approved among the people, and in the midst of them, should be thus abandoned by them too. But both these mysteries are here explained, v. 23, and his death considered. As God's act, and in him it was an act of wonderful grace and wisdom. He delivered him to death, not only permitted him to be put to death, but gave him up, devoted him, this is explained rom 832, he delivered him up for us all. And yet he was approved of God, and there was nothing in this that signified the disapproving of him, for it was done by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, in infinite wisdom, and for holy ends, which Christ himself concurred in, and in the means leading to them. Thus divine justice must be satisfied, sinners saved, God and man brought together again, and Christ himself glorified. It was not only according to the will of God, but according to the counsel of his will, that he suffered and died, according to an eternal counsel, which could not be altered. This reconciled him to the cross, Father, thy will be done, and Father, glorify thy name, let thy purpose take effect, and let the great end of it be attained. As the people's act, and in them it was an act of prodigious sin and folly, it was fighting against God to persecute one whom he approved as the darling of heaven, and fighting against their own mercies to persecute one that was the greatest blessing of this earth. Neither God's designing it from eternity, nor his bringing good out of it to eternity, would in the least excuse their sin, for it was their voluntary act and deed, from a principle morally evil, and therefore they were wicked hands with which you have crucified and slain him. It is probable that some of those were here present who had cried, crucify him, crucify him, or had been otherwise aiding and abetting in the murder, and Peter knew it. However, it was justly looked upon as a national act, because done both by the vote of the great council and by the voice of the great crowd. 
It is a rule, referred her ad universos quat publis fit per majorum paradum that which is done publicly by the greater part we attribute to all. He charges it particularly on them as parts of the nation on which it would be visited, the more effectually to bring them to faith and repentance, because that was the only way to distinguish themselves from the guilty and discharge themselves from the guilt.